Uh, Jesus was perhaps one of the most influential and controversial characters in history. However, his nature and identity is still widely debated today. Some say that Jesus was a prophet. Others might say that he's God's chosen one or Messiah. Still others claim that he is God. So who was Jesus? Was he a prophet, Messiah, or God? And to help us with this, we have the honor of the presence of three speakers tonight. So I'll introduce them quickly to you from this end to the other end. And so we have here Dr. Bernie Power. Uh, he's a lecturer at the Center for the Study of Islam and Other Faiths at Melbourne School of Theology. And we also have Pastor Steve, Steve Katsaras, the founding pastor of Red Words, Red Words Church. And we also have Shahir, uh, a founder of onegod.com, that is one number one god.com.au. And our moderator tonight will be Robert Martin from City Bubble Forum. Please make them feel welcome. Now we have to determine the order of these opening eight minute statements by a very scientific method. But the only method to determine uh, the, the order in these events, which is a paper, scissors, rock competition. <laughs> Bernie was the winner, he's, uh, he's, he's the victorious, <laughs> the rock, <laughs> that's right, Bernie the rock. So he will be uh, uh, presenting first, followed by uh, Shahir, and then Steve will be the third presenter. And once the three have outlined their opening cases, we'll let the conversation begin. And so please, as you, uh, please text away, and um, we look forward to that time very much. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite our first speaker tonight, Bernie Powell. People turned up really exceeded our expectations. This is an important topic, um, and tonight I'm going to put forward the argument that Jesus is God and the Son of God, and I'll explain the difference uh, between those two as as we go on. When we begin to talk about God, um, there's two important principles. The first one is that we must allow God to define Himself. We cannot tell God what He is like. Um, he He must uh, do that. And also recognise that God has spoken to us through revelation. And I'll be using both Christian and Islamic revelation, so the Bible and also the Quran tonight. Both the, Bible, both the Quran recognises the complex nature of God. And here's a couple of verses. You see the chapter and verse, there is no one like God. There is none comparable to him. His creatures will never compass or understand any, anything of his knowledge except that which he wills. And the Bible also talks about how great is the Lord and worthy of praise. No one can fathom his greatness. God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. The great teacher uh, C.S. Lewis, who was a professor at Cambridge University, uh, talking about Christianity, says, if Christianity was something we were making up, of course we could make it simpler, but it isn't. We can't compete in simplicity with people who are inventing religions. How could we? We're dealing with fact. Of course, anyone can be simple if he has no facts to bother about. By the way, I'm not uh, implying these guys are inventing religions. C.S. Lewis was speaking in the context of Greek and Roman religions at that time. And when we look at the facts, what are the facts? In the, the Bible, we find over 60 passages which mention God as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. This is uh, not just a, 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 co a concept in a single book or a single passage. It's a consistent teaching all throughout, um, uh, particularly the New Testament. And what is the, the teaching? It speaks about the divinity of the teacher, of the, of the three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Look at the list of characteristics, and you can see no one else shares these characteristics. Only God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So as Christians, we believe in a God who is multidimensional. The God that is revealed in the Bible is a complex being, not a simple being. Um, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit are inter interconnected. We can't just pull one out uh, and, uh, without disrupting the whole of uh, the, our understanding of God. And so Jesus can only be understood in the context of the Trinity. Jesus is God along with the Father and the Spirit. And if we try to dissociate Jesus from God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, we'll miss out on a true understanding of the nature of, of who Jesus is. Oops. 
um, as Trinitarian Christians, um, we believe that God is and always has existed in a loving relationship. And Jesus, while he was on earth, said to pray to God the Father, you loved me before the creation of the world. The Trinity is, was, and always will be a community of love. But that raises an interesting question. Is Jesus God or the Son of God? And is there a difference between the, these two terms? And I want to give you an analogy. It's, it is an analogy. No analogy is perfect, um, but it helps us understand a little bit. Am I human or am I an individual? And of course, the proper answer is both. I'm a human because I am part of humanity. I have a human nature, but I share that with seven billion other people. But I'm also an individual. I have a, a, a personal identity as Bernie Power, unique to me. I have a DNA and fingerprints that shared by nobody else who has ever been born. And that is uh, my, individual, uh, my individual nature, my personal identity. And when we think of Jesus, then we find that Jesus is God because he shares the divine nature or essence with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, as I showed in an earlier slide. But at the same time, Jesus is the unique Son of God. That personal identity he shares with no one else. Any attempts to uh, represent God di diagrammatically um, will always be inadequate. Um, but we, it just reminds us that the Godhead consists of three persons, fa uh, Father, Son and Spirit, and Jesus Christ is one of those divine persons. Jesus existed uh, from eternity in the Trinity, but at a certain time in history, he took on a human body and became a man. And while he was in that human state, he gave up some of his divine prerogatives. And in the uh, question and answer session, we'll talk about these. Jesus, before the incarnation, before coming to earth, was om omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. That is, uh, could be in any place at any time, had full power, and knew everything. But when he came to earth, he handed over some of those characteristics because he became a person like us. And while it, during this time on earth, we see Jesus acting in a limited kind of role. However, after his death and resurrection, he returned to the full possession of these qualities. But the most important question I think uh, tonight, and I hope we'll come back to it, why would God become a man? Well, um, we can't understand an abstract con concept until we see a concrete example of it. For example, we can talk about beauty, but we really can't understand beauty until we see a beautiful flower or hear a beautiful piece of music. We can talk about goodness, but we won't understand goodness until we see a person who is good and, and righteous. And so with God, we can talk about God, but it's when he becomes focused in a person, in the person of Christ, we can understand more of the nature of God. The Bible says, in Christ, all the fullness of God of uh, deity lives in bodily form. To the second reason that, that God became a man, that Jesus came down to earth, was to bridge the gap between God and humanity. We can't reach up to God. We would like to, but the, the gap is too big. But God can come down to us, and he, did, did, he does come down to us. In Christ, in history, we saw that. The one who loves us comes in person. He doesn't just send a message or a messenger, but actually comes himself. And that's what we saw in Christ. And thirdly, it's to deal with the, the biggest problems, the biggest issues that we face as humans. We need a human a model, a perfect example to follow. Jesus is that. We need to deal with the problem of sin in our lives and in our society um, and to defeat the, the oppression of Satan. And Jesus came and did that. Only God could do these things because they are beyond any human capacity. And that is why, as Christians, we believe that Jesus is God and that he is the Son of God. Thank you. And the second speaker tonight is Shahir, and he will speak now. I'll begin by praising Allah, our Creator and Fashioner, and ask Him to send His peace and blessings upon all His prophets and messengers, including Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus, and Muhammad. Peace be upon them all. As a Muslim, I cannot pick and choose between these prophets. 
I respect and believe them all. I'd like to thank the organizers for setting up this very important discussion. I think it's really fruitful for our society here, where there's Muslims, Christians, and Jews interacting with each other. Perhaps uh, the only person that's missing is a Jew, right? <laughs> Uh, now I've got I've got one request, right? Um, I I don't know how easy it is, but I request you to leave your 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 preconceived notions at least for this debate, right? I'm a Muslim. I come here with my preconceived notion that you know Islam is right. It's Christianity is the same. So at least I don't know how easy it is, but let's try at least because no matter what I would say, you will interpret that within your lenses. So that that defeats the purpose. So, back to our, our question, Jesus a prophet, the Messiah or God? A simple answer is, as a Muslim, I believe Jesus is a prophet, a mighty prophet. He was the Messiah. The Messiah doesn't mean God, by the way. There must, there must be some misconception out there. Um, is he God? No, he's not God. A simple answer. Now, I will, I know I've got eight minutes left, but before I, I, um, I present you this overview and position of Jesus in Islam, I'll tell you a few things. Now, Jesus is a mighty prophet, he is a word from Allah, and is a spirit from Allah. He's preached, he preached monotheism. He preached a message that there's one God and worship him alone, right? We know the Shema, right? The Christians and the Muslims, they, we believe in that, the Shema, right? We, we're not saying something different here. So Jesus, he was born miraculously, we believe in that. He spoke while he was only a baby. That was his first miracle, as opposed to him converting water into wine. Now, we know how big, is a, how big of a problem is alcoholism in this country, right? We don't believe Jesus converted water into wine. We believe he healed those born and blind and the lepers with God's permission. He revived the dead with God's permission and he breathed life into, into a bird made of clay. Now, we also, while we believe in all this, it's all, it's, it's, it sounds good, etc. We Muslims, we don't believe Jesus died or even was crucified on the cross. We, we deny that. In fact, tonight's discussion, me and Steve, we will disagree, we'll agree that Jesus is not God. We'll agree on that point. But we will disagree, I will disagree with both of them on two things, perhaps three things. Original sin, Jesus being the son of God, which Muslims do not even believe. And then the crucifixion. Muslims, we don't believe in crucifixion. How could, how could such a prophet, a mighty prophet, die in such a humiliating way? I do not, pers I, I do not personally believe in that. All right. Uh, who is our God? Who is our God? Now tonight, I would like, I'd like to tell you something. The way I see this discussion today, tonight, I came here to, to propagate the message. As a Muslim, that's all I can do, right? I can only tell you what Islam is. Whether you believe it or not, that's up to you. Allah has given us free will to choose, to use our, our faculties, our mental faculties, to see what's, what's logical, what's logical. And I'm, I'm going to try to tell you that Islam is the most logical, rational religion, simple. The theology is simple. For example, Jesus being the son of God. You know how complicated that, that concept is? I've never met a single Christian who has been able to tell me exactly how Jesus is the unique son of God. In fact, let me tell you something. In the Gospel of John, chapter 316, first epistle of John, it tells you, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him shall not die but have everlasting life, right? Now, if you, I know nowadays people use the NIV translation, right? How many of you use NIV? Is there any, any of you use the King James Bible by any chance? You see, King James popularity has gone down. Right, maybe five or six? Yeah, not many. Because if you read the King James Bible, you will see that verse, it says begotten son, right? This, the word has been taken out. In the NIV, perhaps RSV, you'll see it's written there, Jesus is the unique. They took begotten out, they replaced it with unique, 
right? So it's complicated how Jesus is the Son of God. There's no specific title, you know? Son of God is named by the tongues, right? Romans 8, I think 8.14 or something like that, Paul says, for anyone who is led by the Spirit of God, he's a son of God, right? The Jews, ask them. They, they, know, they know this term as the Bnei Elohim, the sons of God. Anyone who believes in Allah, anyone who believes in Allah, who is a religious person, he's a son of God. So in that sense, even Jesus is the son of God. Now some people ask me, how exactly? Well, uh, according to, uh, you know, that verse that I said before, I said before, Jesus is somehow unique, right? In the beginning was the word, the words, were, you know that, right? Right? And the word became flesh, etc. For us, actually, I love that verse. That's my favorite verse. Because it agrees, it agrees with the Islamic position. In the beginning was the word, of course. Allah's word is uncreated, right? The word, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Of course, the word was with God, right? Jesus, eventually, when you, when, you look, when you read further, and the word became flesh, you know that verse, right? For us, it doesn't make any, any problem. Because you know yourself, the Father, uh, Jesus said, the words that I speak is not mine, but my Father's. So anything that he utters is from God. But he himself was a human being, right? So that's, that doesn't mean anything to me. I will end perhaps, I don't, how many minutes do you have now? One minute? That's good. Because I'm going to end with that verse. I'm going to bring you back to Allah, to our God. We don't have any free gods, whatever. You know, we, God is clear. If God is one, there should, make, there should be only one religion. If, if I meet, let me do that. Anyway, Qul Hu Allahu Ahad, chapter 112, verses 1, 2, 3, 4. Anyone who fit that four-like definition, we don't have any problem to say he's God. Say he's Allah, the one and only, the one, Ahad. Now, some people might try to argue Ahad, etc. It means composite unity will, I'm eagerly anticipating that. Allah the Eternal, we don't believe a God who died. Whether he changes his nature, he becomes, he becomes man. God cannot die, remember that. You believe in that. He begets not, nor is he begotten. How can God create another God? He begets not. Now, some people might ask, you know, the begetting now is not physical. In fact, you'll see. Bernie will, be, will believe that spiritual, and Pastor Steve, he begets. He believes it's, it's physical. You'll see. In fact, I'll let the Christians debate that issue within themselves. And there's none like unto him. Right? So I end with that. Thank you very much. And once Shahir clears his... You're right there, Shahir? Excellent. I think that's the... We don't need the data projector anymore. And now we'll have a final uh, presentation by Steve Casares. Thank everyone for uh, coming out to uh, hear this uh, important discussion. I'm not used to using a, a microphone, but uh, that's okay. And I don't have anything, have anything prepared as far as uh, multimedia presentation, so I guess I'm just really going to speak from uh, what I know. Uh, I pastor Redwoods Church, and uh, I'm grateful to be here to discuss this subject with Bernie and Shahir. I sort of fit in the middle of this discussion. It's quite ironic that I'm sitting in between both of them. Uh, I agree in part with Bernie. I agree in part with Shahir. Um, the Bible is a monotheistic book. The Bible is exclusive on that fact. The Bible teaches that God is the only God. I believe uh, we all three can agree on that, that there is only one God, and the Bible speaks about that. But I think where we differ here is on our definition of what monotheism is. While Bernie has defined his view of monotheism, and Shahir has defined his, I'm hoping that I can define mine. The Bible, as Bernie uh, said earlier, is... Uh, a book about the self-revelation of God. God has expressed himself undeniably over and over again about who he is. And we can learn a little bit about who this one God is. The nation of Israel were taken out from the many, many nations that were polytheists at the time to establish a very vital truth that there is only one God. And with that, with the giving of Torah, he gave them 
the paramount commandment or the paramount creed, the Shema, which uh, Shahir cited, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Or in the Hebrew, <coughs> one, one Yahweh or one Adonai. Or in the Greek, one Gideos. Now, as you proceed through the Old Testament and even into the New Testament, what you find is as God is, uh, I guess, revealing himself, what we're finding through the authors is a very startling fact that thousands upon thousands upon thousands of times the authors consistently and continually use the singular personal pronoun to describe the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Now that should alert us to the fact that every faithful Jew always believed that this one God, not one person within a being of God, this one God, this one Theos, this one Elohim, is one person. Not three in one, not two in one, one person. That's common logic and common reason for when we use singular personal pronouns for each of ourselves, we are always referring to one person and not two or three or four. Now, this theme, this vital truth is paramount all throughout the Old and New Testament. You find that in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, in Mark chapter 12, verse 29, you see Jesus affirming the Shema when he, was, uh, when he was asked by a scribe, what is the greatest commandment? He said, the Shema. Jesus was a faithful Jew who affirmed the one, the, the one God, the one unipersonal God. With that statement alone, Jesus does not qualify to be a Trinitarian today. Now, it's very important, I believe, that in defining the one God, we are, in some uh, sense, defining then who Jesus is. For if I stand before you and I say that God is one person, then it's clear I do not believe that Jesus is God in an ontological pre-existent sense as Bernie has defined earlier. That's where we differ here. Um, Shahir believes in the one God. He be that, 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 that's, I guess, the, the, the reality regarding Islam that, they, that Shahir, like every other faithful Muslim, will affirm the unity of, uh, of this God, the indivisible unity, this unipersonality, which we agree with. But as far as Jesus is concerned, as far as who is he as a person, I guess that's where we differ and disagree. So if the Bible speaks about one God, this one unipersonal God who is Yahweh, or as Jesus described him, the Father, for that's what Jesus continuously said, he's my Father, he's your Father, he says, I sent to my God and your God, and he spoke that post his resurrection, and even in his exalted state in Revelation chapter 3, he said, uh, he said to one of the churches that if you, if you do what's right, then you'll take upon the name of my God, um, be in the, in the same temple as my God. So he continues to affirm my God, even today in his post-exalted uh, state. So who is Jesus if he's not God? Part of this uh, discussion night was postulated three points of view. Prophet, Messiah, or God. I believe he is a prophet. For that's what uh, Moses predicted in Deuteronomy 18. One like myself, a prophet from among your own countrymen, from your own brethren, will arise to speak. Him you shall hear. And Peter affirms that in Acts chapter 4. He affirms that, that Mosaic prophecy to Jesus. He is that prophet. So yes, Jesus is a prophet. He is God's prophet. Absolutely, I affirm all that. Is he Messiah? Yes, he is. What does Messiah mean? Messiah or Christ means uh, the anointed one. The anointed one. People in the Old Testament were anointed, notably kings. Saul was anointed. David was anointed. Is Jesus God? Well, that's a rather uh, challenging question. No, he's not God in an ontological sense as Bernie postulated. He is God in a representative sense, which hopefully we'll get into later in the evening and show that People, prophets, especially kings in the Old Testament who were called by God were able to bear the title of God in a representative sense because they were representing the one true God before the people. That 
then plays into the term Son of God, which we can chat later. Um, but one last thing I want to leave you with is the following. Is, is that Jesus did not pre-exist. The birth narratives, read uh, Matthew chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, clearly show that Jesus had a beginning. He ha his existence began in the womb of his mother Mary. The language in the birth narratives is very strong and I'm happy to discuss more of it in our discussion night. Um, so in, in closing, I just really want to say that my point of view is, is that there is one God and that is the Father. Over and over thousands of times the word Theos is used for the Father and Jesus is his Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, God's Christ, God's King of Kings. Thank you very much.